All right, yeah. enough of that. Uh, camp opens today. Here's a question that we're going to use as our jumping off point. Which player has the most to prove this training camp for the Browns? Who is it? We should have threw the caveat. We can't say Deshaun Watson because that, yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the obvious well, answer. I'm, to when I saw the question, I'm like, is that a real question? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I guess. I, I guess I assume we all would say not Deshaun. Okay, Watson. Okay, because I mean, he's the I, did, I, I put yeah. I put point one second. <laughs> into yeah. thinking about this because yeah. I thought, well, that's easy. That's easy. Okay, so good, outside G. of Deshaun okay. Watson, it, my bad. Good, good distinction because we all agree. Everybody agrees. Yeah. The fan yeah. base agrees. The there are many, many futures and jobs that are pinned to Deshaun Watson being good this year. That's all, all of them. Yeah. yeah. Because this is it. This is the make or break. That's year. right. This mm-hmm. is it. This regime is hearing the clock in the background and. The clock is the watch on Deshaun Watson's wrist. Out, who has the most to prove? Um, this is this is. It, it was kind of tough if you take Deshaun Watson out. I'm gonna go with Jedrick Wills. Um, Interesting. He is, he got his his fifth year guaranteed to him, so he got his money. But there is something to be <laughs> said when we go back and evaluate. Right, if they don't sign Jedrick Wills to another contract and he's not the left tackle of the future, that goes down as a massive whiff. You drafted him in the top 10, uh, and, and and I think more than anybody, Jedrick Wills has been handled with kid gloves like I've never seen in my life. Like, you know, we'll, we'll take Miles Garrett to task. We'll talk about Nick Chubb, can't get his, his money next year because running backs are diminished. We already know what we say about Deshaun Watson. Like, Donovan Peoples-Jones, we've already told him, you're going to be on another team because you ain't good enough. But when it comes to Jedrick Wills, it's, well, hold on. Maybe is it too bad? I mean, he, he. I mean, I know what the grades say, and I do see the clips where he just stands up and not, doesn't do anything. But <laughs> there's, I mean, really, can we get anybody better? So why don't we is just that, get, is that it right there? Because like good left tackle, great left tackles don't fall out of trees. They don't. Or yeah, Thank God, I, they I crush think, everybody. I think that's another <laughs> thing, and then then he gets the benefit of of coming after Joe Thomas a little bit. So you think that you're judging him hard, or very harsh, because. Hey, it's not Joe Thomas. What do you want to? What are you looking for? Right. So we give him the benefit of doubt a little bit. Yeah. Um. But to me, that's a top ten pick. And one of the things that we've said, if you want to be a good organization, um, when Perry on Winfrey got in trouble, somebody said, "Are you going to bring in a replacement? Are you going to bring in somebody?" At some point, the the replacements have to be the guys you draft. Yeah, they do. The replacements have to be the dudes Especially on the roster. Especially when they're drafted that highly. Yes, that highly. So, so. I, I will go. J- J- who who you got, Bull? Well, because I got a couple other names that are popping into my head. There's a bunch of guys, and Jedrick Wills is certainly one of them. I considered Elijah Moore. Yeah. Uh, Mm. I considered uh, JOK as well. But Mm. ultimately, the guy with the most to prove is David Njoku. That's my guy. (laughs) That's my guy. (laughs) David Njoku has been paid Mm -hmm. as an elite tight end. Yeah. David Njoku has been at his best a above average tight end. And even that is stretching maybe a little average to slightly above average. How's this? He's in he's been in the upper half of tight end. Sure. But, but, but so if that makes him above average, but yeah. it's barely, but he's on the lower end <clears throat> of the upper half. I agree with that. And 100%. The, the money he's been paid, the opportunities be, he's been given. Everything is set up for him to have a great year this year. Yeah. And if he doesn't find and the only thing I'll say is, you know, Travis Kelsey and and guys like that, they're the anomalies. There are a lot of tight ends who have taken a while to develop, but this is a long time, and mm-hmm. this is the last chance. And he's the, of, of all the guys we've mentioned that are that have something to prove. He's making the most money, so he's got the most to prove to yeah. me. I agree with that. He was the first guy that came into my mind after we moved the uh, assignment to anybody but Deshaun Watson. Right. A couple other names that popped into my head. You might both look at me like I'm crazy here. But Denzel Ward's been a little off. Well, he that, had a down year that, last year. No, 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 no doubt. That's what I'm saying. I yeah. like that. I like that. I, a little I need bit. him I like that. to be the Denzel Ward that we saw the first couple of years. He wore a Browns uniform. Yeah. He was jumping routes, Jay. He, I know he, he was. Had a, he had a in zone jumping coverage. Jumping routes and making mistakes and reads. Yeah. yeah and like, coverages. It, it was just like he was he was playing the ball. It looked like. His, his instincts coming out of – see, that's going to happen a little bit. Sometimes when you come out of college and you especially come out of a college that, that is, is competitive, like steel sharpens steel, and you get out of there and you're young, you're energetic, and, and the thing that they always teach you is make plays. You making plays or not, or you just in your gap. We don't need people just in that gap. We need playmakers. 
And sometimes you can get into a league or you can get into a place where you start, you know, being under certain coaches and their philosophy change. Well, well guys, look, we're going to give up some of that stuff, guys. It's okay. We'll rally and tackle. Nah, we need, we, we paying you like you the top of the food chain. But really, when you look at it, he's getting paid top three or four. He's probably maybe 10, 11. If you ask it about corners. Yeah. Um, and the production just doesn't seem to be there. Now we've all if he had production, we put up with the injury stuff, right? He's like yeah. we always we see he gonna miss two, three games a year. But the production has to be there. And I hope under Schwartz, he lights that fire to say, come on, Denzel, you're getting paid like an elite playmaker. We need that. You said something there, G, that really, really strikes a chord. It was brilliant. You said that you have a fear that when he was in that Ohio State program, there was no tolerance for no slacking. At Zero. All. None. The statement, the mission statement every year was very clear. Mm -hmm. We're winning the chip. That's what we're about here at Ohio State. And then you said steel sharpens steel. They all make each other better. And I'm sure, I, I almost wish Tyvis was here so he yep. could talk to this. He's probably seen a difference in some of the locker rooms that he played in in the NFL. Some tolerated nonsense, yeah. some did not. I love that steel sharpened steel comment because it's obvious the culture in Cleveland is not the culture in Columbus. No, it and certainly wonder, hasn't been. Yeah. It has not been, no. no. And I wonder if the apathy has affected Denzel Ward. Shoot, I, I, I How went, can it not? I, I went from playing in Camp McKinley. We won two state championships. You're a perfect example of it. I get to OU, and the first we I'm playing as a freshman, and I look around, <clears> and we had like defensive backs playing basketball like over the goalpost. We in Buffalo, and I'm like, Buffalo is one of the worst teams in the country, and I'm looking around, and we get into the game, and we are just getting destroyed. They beat us. I mean, they was beating us 41 to nothing. And I go to the sidelines, and the first thing I did is look at my coaches and be like, oh, hell no, nah, this ain't going to work. This not. Because it, they had that blank stare like, we've already punted. We ready to go to on the next week. We're going to burn this tape. Nobody was angry. Nobody was upset. Yeah, that's and, the culture. And, and, and Camp McKinley, that wouldn't have flown. I mean, you one guy makes one bad play. He's on he's the bench. He's on the bench. Like, you, you got, you know, you playing with all Americans. You're just trying to survive at that point. And then when I went there and saw the difference, I said, oh, this is going to be a problem. And, and, you, and you automatically knew that there was levels to it. And it was the first time when people say they become demoralized. I was de I was shook to the core because I said, you don't put this amount of work in just to go out there and get beat and hang out. But they have been losing for so many years. The mentality wasn't even, it wasn't even, it, it was, there was no culture of winning. So I, I'm afraid when I see stuff like that, you can look at Jeff Okuda. You can look at guys that played in the secondary at Ohio State. You go from Ohio State where Alabama and Georgia, that's the key in Michigan. We not we don't respect no Mac teams. We don't respect no Sun Belt teams. And then you get to Cleveland and then you start losing to the Lions and losing to the Jets on onside. How many times have you ever seen somebody get an onside kick? I know. <laughs> I it know. just don't happen. It don't happen mm -hmm. in Little League. Especially when they know it's coming. It's yeah, coming. Right. one thing if there's an element of surprise, but when you know what they're doing and it they doesn't it happen off, unless it's week two against the Jets. Yeah, right. That's it. By That's the it. way, you know who we did not mention? The I have, the I have one guy, too. Name him. Well, Bo, you say first. I think we're on the same line. Cade York. Oh, I wasn't oh, going there, but yeah, Cade no, York is a good one. Cade York. You guys yeah. talk no, Cade I'm York, and then I'll Cade. toss mine out next. The yeah. thing about Cade York is he made some great kicks. He but made he one was, great kick. Well, that but I, that he made a couple of long, a couple of the long ones. But he was very inconsistent. He was wildly the percentage inconsistent. was not good enough. Yeah. And the bottom line at that position is, you, if he's not good this year, he's gone. It Even depends though he was on drafted. how bad he is. Like if he has another year like that, it won't be good. But I think it would be good enough for another year. Because again, Maybe. it's just like the Jed Wills thing. That's <laughs> these dudes aren't falling out of trees. Well, but. There's only one kicker job, and if there's a guy up, there's a guy out there they think could be better, they'll move on, even though he was drafted. Yeah, but you and know, the he Browns has the potential have done that before, to be really good. And then 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 the guy goes to Minnesota and becomes a Pro Bowl. Right, right, right. Yeah, I hear you. Our funny mentality. You know, sometimes it just takes them a little bit. We talked about the goat and how he started off very rough. Go look at Justin Tucker's early yep. years as a kicker. Not great. He missed a lot of kicks. 
By and even year two? I can't remember what his year. It, yeah, I, I, I got his numbers right here. Two. I think yeah. it was. Like, year one was not Justin Tucker-like. And I think it his struggles kind of carried into year two. Okay, and so. And then he became, like, automatic. So, year one and two were actually really, really good. Years three and four okay. is where he dipped. Okay. There you year go. one, he was 90% 30 of 33. Year two, 94% 39 of 41. Wow. And then the next two years, he dipped to 83% and 82%. Yeah, which is – And then he's gone back after that. Right. So, he goes 82%. But he, he went he 38 of 39 the next year. probably years. never been in the 80s since his fourth yeah. year. Yeah, no. On a percentage uh, this this most recent year, he was 86%. Was he really? Wow. 37 of 43, but he missed – 360 yarders. So the point yeah. is, they he's drafted, almost a victim of his own success. The Browns drafted Cade York high for a kicker. Fourth, third round or fourth round? Where was fourth, it? I think. Fourth, fourth round. Fourth round. You draft a kicker in the fourth round. He's got to perform. You're expecting him to be good. Yes. Not, I don't want to have to wait till year three or four. No, you're for right. Him to get you're right. Good. He's on. I don't want to say he's on the clock, but he's under the microscope. Yes, for no sure. doubt. Sure. Gosh, there's a lot of guys on this. If you Can look, I throw one more out to you. Yeah, I'm surprised no one mentioned this, but to me, Talkie the talkie. number one guy. It's a different linebacker. It's JOK. Yeah, I he mentioned, mentioned JOK. You mentioned JOK. As one of the guys, but as one of the guys we mentioned, it could have been, but not one of those we talked about. To yeah. me, yeah. JOK is the answer, and you guys are all right in your own different ways. But right, we need to know two things about JOK. One, how is does Jim linebacker? Schwartz plan? Well, I guess three. <laughs> is he a linebacker? B, <laughs> if he is, how does Jim Schwartz plan to unleash him? And then three, and we're not going to learn this in training camp, but can the dude stay healthy? Yeah. Is he physically capable yeah. of being a long-term solution in that second level of defense? Yeah, no, and I that's know that's a not point. a training camp question to be answered. Yeah. But to well, me, it could be. he has to prove. I mean, the guys do get dinged in training fair. camp. He has to prove that he can learn Jim Schwartz's system and figure out how to actually be a guy who's yeah. not I, I like a that. secondary. The interesting thing with JOK, all these other guys we mentioned are NFL players. We're just asking to be better NFL yeah, players. Yeah, you're right. I don't know if we. I don't know that for sure that JOK is an NFL player. Yeah, I mean, Jackson agrees. I, I think, yeah, I know he does strongly. Yeah. So I think, you know what? I, here's what I think this exercise shows, guys. Get your thoughts. Yeah. Um, it's what we've talked about. This is perhaps the most pivotal year for the Browns in the last decade. And I know that, I know you could say, well, after they made the yeah. playoffs, you know, you want them to com- continue that success. But there are, I, I can think of front office wise, if this, if this doesn't work, if, if they end up underperforming, say, 7 and 10 oh, and no, miss no, the playoffs, no, 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 no. Yeah. it's rotten at the top. And I think Stefanski could be in big trouble. I think Andrew Barry could be in trouble. I think at some point they have to look long and hard whether or not Paul DePodesta should hold the keys to this franchise. Well, I, I mean, all of that is true. If, if Deshaun Watson is not good yeah, and – for whatever reason. Again, yeah. I think he's going to be good. But if he's just – he's mentally scarred, he can't get over the – whatever, can't get over the knee injury, whatever, whatever it is. Yeah. If, let's say he's not good. All right? Stavansky's fired. Barry's fired. Uh, maybe D Podesta too. Who knows? Uh, I he's think, been the common link through a couple of regimes. I think Nick Chubb's gone. Oh, really? Because they're not going to pay him – he's going to – he's cap hit is $16 million. Yeah. If – if Deshaun Watson stinks and they're like, in a way, they're starting over. Now they can't because they still locked into him. Yeah. And I hate to go down this road too much because I don't think it's going to happen. But I think Miles Garrett could certainly be gone. He's going to want out of here. It could be a complete the whole, total blow So, off. yes, this is the I, – I think it's the biggest year, certainly, in the, at least the 12 years I've been covering. And, the and that, it feels like a bull. And, and that's why that's why I've been, I've been pounding the concrete to people to say all the time, well – Come on, you know, guys are good. Just go ahead and chill. I said, there's no chill in this offseason. There's none. You, you wasted the chill last year. It's done. Like, you got to think about it, man. We waited through, we waited through 0-16, 1-15, and right, to get Baker. We, we did that to get Nick Chubb. We did that to get Miles Garrett. We did that to get Denzel Ward. Well, let's Th- start to see some fruit. Those picks, those picks are all guys that we drafted from being the terrible, most worst team in the league. Baker's gone. We just talked about Denzel Ward. He, if, if the Browns aren't good this year, they're definitely looking to move and, and say, hey, yeah. uh, let's look at what, what did Jaylen, we get for Jalen Ramsey. Can we get off this contract? Miles Garrett is the only person that you have left on your roster that can bring you back any draft capital. 
they probably move him and listen to three or four teams if they wanted to give up. So this whole house of cards could come Gone. crumble. Yeah, right. If if it's if Deshaun Watson isn't the guy, right, then this franchise is <laughs> damn near taking and on almost the, erasing the whole thing and starting over. That's true. On the other hand, if he is the guy, there's no limit to how good they can be. Really? There's, I I think so. I, I agree. I, now listen. Kansas City, Buffalo, Cincinnati are up here. Yeah. The Browns got to get there. But you're and, saying if Deshaun but is good. I, I think if Deshaun is Houston Deshaun again, they could reach that level with those other three teams. That's the goal. Now, those teams are safer bets to be there. Yeah. But They are. I and mean, the AFC is tough. I mean, the quality of the AFC, it was already high last year. It's even better this year. Yeah. Because think about all the teams. And they're young. Right. Think about all the teams that were really good last year. Well, Cincinnati, yeah, they got worse at safety, but they got better on the offensive line. Overall, they're just as good. Sure. Not, not to mention, you think about Burrow. His first year, training camp was COVID. His second year, he was coming off a torn ACL. Last year, I don't know if, you're, if you guys remember this, he had a burst appendix yes, right in his training camp. Yeah. So this yeah. is his first normal training camp. Right. We, we know what the Chiefs are, how good they are with sure. Mahomes. The Jaguars are just going to get better with Trevor Lawrence. Yes. The Bills are still really good. That, you know, what, what have they That's lost? That's four teams that right. could easily win Miami, an AFC championship. I personally think Miami's going to go a little backwards, but if two is healthy, he was good, really good when he was he's healthy. He's great when he's healthy. Year, right? We know the Ravens don't stink. We know the Steelers will be competitive. We know the, the Jets are a little like the Browns. It's an older quarterback, but it's like, well, if Aaron Rodgers plays at an MVP level, they're, they're certainly a playoff contender. Boy, it's, a, it's, a, I mean, it's not a great time to make an all-in move in the AFC. It's tricky. And it's very yeah. tricky. And I didn't even mention the Chargers. Yeah. <laughs> I know, who I think, despite the fact they've got a lot of talent, I think their coach has really kept yeah. them from doing, you know, right. he, 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 his, his idea of the tie game, uh, yeah. and that kept him out of the playoffs two years ago. Last year, didn't they blow the big lead to Jacksonville? Huge. Mm -hmm. I mean, to yeah. me, I'm, I'm, I know he's considered one of the bright young coaches, and I know he's got ties here to Northeast Ohio. I'm shocked he's still employed by, Agreed, by the Chargers. But they'll still be good. Yeah, yeah they, will, they will be. I mean, I mean, they're going to be really good, and they I, could be a team that makes that major jump right? because they've kind of been off the radar because of his flubs the last two years. Right, and, it, you know, so there's not you – know, who's bad in the AFC? God. Houston's bad. The rest of the South – you know, the South is bad besides The South is in general. Le but outside of that, like – The Colts, the Titans, yeah. not a whole lot the of The Raiders are there. probably not that good, but, what you if, know. What if the – play? There's, there's, there's a, the best of both worlds. Like, yeah. it's, it's, the, it's the world where it's heaven and world where it's hell. Think about this concept. What if the players we do have on the roster are even better than we thought because they had a quarterback? What if, what if we're very possibility? We love Dick Chubb, right? Then we you know what? Then, then you throw the Browns in with all the teams Bull just mentioned. Right, yes. Like, it, because it, the talent, the roster is there. The roster's talented. Just, yeah. Here's the question Do we get Houston Deshaun or do we get last six games of the season Deshaun? Yeah, I That's think it's it. more likely that we get Houston Deshaun. I hope so. Uh, and if but, we do, but, I believe that Bull, uh, G. Bush, you're right. We got to see it, though. We got to see, see it. it. Yeah. <laughs> That's why he is easily the answer to that question right I mean he's got everything to prove and, and I think one of the, the main storylines we're going to talk about all like now that the season has started the biggest question is how much are they going to play in the preseason because yeah. because to me that's no longer dismissible right you, they literally have to look at all right guys I know we don't want to do it with injuries Andy Reid does it he, he Andy did, Reed plays his players. Play, and yeah. they cannot afford to have no week one, no, week I agree two, with trying you. to figure it I, out I stuff. agree with you. When they take the field in September for the first game, I want there to be rapport. I want there to be a track record of success, even if it is in the in the preseason. I want them to not look like they're, it's a dress rehearsal. Yeah, yeah, they've got, I agree, they're playing the Bengals week one. It's a tough test right you off the bat. You come out of the gate shoot, So man. you you got to be ready to go for yeah. that game. I, I, I think that this is the year, if there's ever been a year, that you blow up this idea that they play very, very little. That's become the trend, especially yeah. now that it's down to just yeah. three games. Blow that up. They're blowing something else up, and I want to see if you guys like this. They're blowing up the idea of training the entire training camp at home this year for the first time. And I can't remember when the last time was that the Browns took their camp 
out of Cuyahoga County mm -hmm. or out of the Northeast Ohio area. I, in my lifetime, I don't know that it's, I don't know that it's ever happened. I don't know if, if, if we have a viewer out there that wants to look it up or Mikey, you, but I can't remember a time when the Browns took their training camp out of state. Right. And this year they're doing that. They're going down to Greenbrier. It's a beautiful resort down there in West Virginia, but don't make plans to go because fans aren't welcome. Closed environment. What do we make of that? Does that, does that matter? Does it make a difference? And do you guys like it? Go ahead, G. I, I, I think it, I, I like it. Um, we've done that before. Um, we have? Well, well we, I've done that oh, before okay, in my playing okay. career. And it's, it's different. Like, there's something to be said for you being secluded. So, you know, we in, in college, we, you got your own apartment, your houses. They would take us somewhere far off campus, and we, we'd have to basically, like, walk back and forth a long way. We would be having meetings, and it would be all away from the normal stuff. Like, you couldn't have a car. Like, they take your car keys, and you're just sure. there. Like, you can't move. You're not going off campus. You can't eat nothing. And, and what it does, it, it makes you focus because the only thing that's there is football. The only voice that's there is the teammates' voice, the coach's voice, and trying to learn stuff. And you're in this silo. And I remember, you know, going to um, a remote place in high school like called Edinburgh. <laughs> Edinburgh, Pennsylvania. It's a small little school. We went to a camp. And our team in 1997, we won a national championship. In so 98, they were like, listen, you go to all these nice camps. Like, let's go to Ohio State or let's go to, like, team camps. And they're like, no, we're going to Edinburgh because we had a new coach at the time. And he was taken over from a coach that won a national championship. That's like a Hall of Fame coach. So now it's like, well, I got to put my imprint on it. I got to put my stamp on it. And he took us to Edinburgh and it was dry. It was dusty. It was hot. And we're just there with these other teams. And I just remember like thinking about, man, the only thing that was mattering at that time, not girlfriends, not nothing was the fact that you was there trying to figure out how to get through this like this tough period of time. And what happened was when we got back and started doing two days and stuff, it, it gave us this this little sense of security. Just you know, Bull was talking about his son as being off and doing different things and shooting archers and stay he'll come back and he'll have five, ten years of experience. He'll feel like, wow, he's kind of mature because there's something to be said for going off somewhere and the first night you're being scared, by the third night you got friends, by the fifth night you're like, oh, I could do this. Yeah. That's why people go camping and, and go to retreats is to find that inner thing. So I love it. I love the fact that it, they're, they're telling those and they're signifying, guys, this is important. If, if you want to be what you want to be, Miles Garrett and Deshaun Watson, you want your career back and Nick Chubb, you want to get in the playoffs and Joe Batonio, don't be like Joe Thomas. That's what they're telling them. This is what's going to take to get there. And so I think it's brilliant for them to do it. And I think they should, they should be locked in, ready to go when they come back. Bull? Yeah, I mean, you think about it. I mentioned before Joe Burrow's training camps. The Browns have, you know, Kevin Stefanski was a new coach the COVID year, right? They went to the playoffs. Things kind of went south. Last year, it was a weird training camp because the Deshaun Watson, Watson suspension was hovering over the team the entire time. And so this feels like the first normal training camp for the Browns in a while. Mm -hmm. And I think Kevin Stefanski said, uh, we have to do something different, right? What we've been doing has not been working. Mm -hmm. We'll find out if this helps. You know, if they do well, we'll, we'll, we're going to say, well, I guess this did something. Mm -hmm. Who knows for sure? But there's something to be said for what you said there. Now, I don't know that the players, the NFL players, are going to have the restrictions that you guys had. I would hope they do because I would think – that if they're spending, how long are they going to be there? Oh, Ten eight, days? Eight days, eight, I think. Like I think that. eight days. Eight yes. days. Like, if, if, if they basically have to be on campus, if you will, yeah. the entire time, like, that's good chemistry building. That's good team building there. And that's something this team could use. I mean, th and it gives Deshaun Watson a chance to maybe cement himself as the leader of the team, which is important. Yeah. I think it is. Um, I'm going to echo everything you guys said, and I'm going to throw a lot more onto it. I love the idea. I think it's the best idea this franchise has come up with in the last couple of years. And here's why. The location was, was key. Edinburgh wasn't glamorous. It was gritty. Right, yeah, yeah. Greenbrier, West Virginia is a beautiful resort, but there's nothing to do there. That's right. There's no trouble to find. There's nowhere they're going to go where they're going to uh, somebody's going to get in, in big trouble at two o'clock in the yeah, morning. Yeah. Right? 
it's isolated, it's secluded, and it's just the team. And I've got a little bit of experience with this. When I was covering the Buccaneers and they were in Tampa, they trained at the University of Tampa. Mm -hmm. And Tony Dungy liked the idea that it was home. The players could sleep in their own beds. Then they decided, I think wisely, let's move this thing off-site. Now, they did it for different reasons. They did it because they wanted to sort of give their fan base in Central Florida an opportunity to see the Bucks mm -hmm. training camp. So they moved it to Disney in, in Orlando. And the media bitched and moaned because, you know, we had to go to Orlando for, for 10 days or mm -hmm. whatever, and we weren't in our own beds. But when John Gruden came in, there was team building that was taking place that I was quite frankly surprised to see because Tony Dungy was a beloved head coach. You talked when the when when the Bucks fired Tony Dungy, it felt like a wake mm. at the at the facility. Mm -hmm. I remember when, you know, I think I've talked about it on the show, Tony graciously met individually with all the reporters and it just felt like a wake. You saw players milling about the building, heads down, no smiles, very quiet. They lost their beloved guy. So Gruden had an uphill climb, but when they were in Disney, they became one. They rallied around the concept of team. John was a much different leader. He was a rah-rah, slap you on the ass and tell you to get your act together, where Tony was just a quiet whistleblower. You know, he never, he stood in the background and it was no, no, you know, he never swore. And I, I, I watched that team come together under John when they were off-site, and that's where their Super Bowl run began. Remember, John won it in his first season. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I think that this team, for whatever reason, and I'm not going to point fingers at any players, I'm not going to say it's a lack of leadership, for whatever reason, the culture here has been toxic since the return. I mean, with yeah. few exceptions. Right. You know, they had the playoff season uh, in in. 2020 or it was 20, 2020 they made the yep. playoffs. Mm -hmm. They had the playoff season, but none of this success was sustained. And what really led to sort of the spiral, the downward spiral of that 21 team was bitching inside the team. You know, you had the Odell and the Baker mm -hmm. thing. And I think when the final history book is written on the early yep, 2020s, yep. Yep. that's going to be what, well, that, yep, was that, the, was it. that was the crashing point. Mm -hmm. So I love this idea. They're all going to go together. You know what they're going to do? And I joked about this on the show, and I think somebody that had the itinerary, maybe it was Jason, said, yep, you're absolutely right. That's what they're going to do. They're going to go bowling one night. They're going to go to a movie one night. Swim. They're probably <laughs> going to uh, go and play laser tag or capture the flag. They're going to do team bonding outside of football activities. Right. And they're going to, if they don't already, really get to know one another. Not in a football sense, but what was the most important moment of your childhood? That kind of get to know. Because you got a lot of time and you're bunking with someone. Man. Yeah. And I, I, you know, yeah. I've never been a part of a team that's gone away for a period of time to do that. But I know people that have, and they all say, like you said, you grow together as you grow up. And yeah. I love the idea, like you said, it might work, it might not. But I think if there's a really good chance that it will, and we know this, what they had been doing was not working. Definitely not. So shake it up. Yeah. And I think it's a brilliant move by whoever, if it was Stefanski's idea, Andrew Barry, I don't know who came up with the idea, but they deserve a lot of credit. And yeah. I, I think it's going I think we're gonna see a different chemistry and a different culture in this team, at least to start the season. Yeah, and early camp is a good time to do it anyway. You talk about all these other non-football activities. It's not like the football in the first week, first, especially the first four or five days of camp is not that intense anyway. Right. So, it, you know, like, I, I just think it's a good time to say, yeah, I mean, to do all these things, to get to know each other, uh, and, and hopefully it'll work because – I, Man, I, nothing else has. I, com yeah, so I, I commend them because what they did, they they pretty much changed. I think Stefanski understood that I'm a personality um, that is, I'm going to be kind of, he's more of a Tony Dungy. He's not going to be, he's, Stefanski doesn't say crazy things. He's just, you know, calm, cool, collected. But I thought, I think he understood that he couldn't have a guy like Joe Woods who was the same way. Right. Or Mike Prefer that was the same way. Yeah, you need a good cop, bad cop. You or whatever. need it, and they didn't switch that all the way up. Both those new coaches are intense guys. They're, they are very. And, intense. and you know, you yeah. notice one thing. Last year, you had guys like Clowney saying, 
oh, well, I'm only, I'm only going to play on certain downs. You had busted and coverage and people turn around and pointing to different people. And, and you even had, to a certain extent, Greg Newsom, who's a, who's a mild-mannered kid that has never – all of a sudden, he's saying what, what he's not going to do and what he is going to do. <laughs> Telling the, the I said, I said, whoa, hold on now. Now, now, now you notice something? I don't hear, I don't hear very much no more. No, it's been quiet. Uh, it's early, to be fair. But, yeah. but, but, yeah, but, but, but when he came on. I don't on, think we're going to hear that. But stuff. when he came on, his tune was changed a little bit. Like, oh, no. That's true. Slot. Sure. That's Good soldier. Yeah, you true. know, I love what you said about you can't have too many of the same types. If you're going to typecast coaches, I think the Browns have the perfect mix yes. right now. They have the professor running the offense. Mm-hmm. You mm-hmm. want you want this kind of mad genius yeah. running mm-hmm. the offense, and I think Stefanski fits that bill. You want the drill sergeant running the defense, yeah. and you kind of want that maniac running the special teams. Right. Yeah. And yeah. I think they've got it. I agree. I think it's a really nice mix. Now they've got to win, yeah. right. but I, I think right now the, the way the coaching staff is constructed – I think it's kind of out of central casting, and, mm-hmm. I, and I hope it works. Yeah. I hope it works. All right, Mike. 